Um, I think that we have a unique situation that we have a small community and people are willing to work and we know people and so I think it's great. Because um, when you look at emergency action plans, it talks about look at your venue, look at, you know, have a specific emergency plan for each venue. And we understand that, but we also understand, too, that um, it's small enough to where we don't have to be, you know, clenched about our venues and who's going to come and, and see us or help us. Um, and the timeout, that's one of the big things, and I try to introduce myself, as does Kim, to the, the people who are, you all, who are there to help us, and one of the things I told the group that was there Friday night, if I need you, two hands are going up. Um, I have a little student manager, and he's like, what do I do? And I said, well, if you see two hands go up, go get EMS. So, um, you know, we talk about you know, just discussing that. Um, I share with my coaches, you know, I always have an AED on the um, golf cart. I had a kid go down in football, and I looked at a kid and I said, grab the AED, and he was a football player, and he knew to go get it and where to bring it. So, you know, just small, quick timeouts like that we found. Um, when or when not to remove equipment, how to remove football equipment, and um, CB and Kim and I were talking about the A plus lifting slide technique. We know that we're going to do the scoop stretch. Um, but I want to show some literature that, that we've seen um, and want to share it with you all. It's, you know, good stuff. So um, just go through that really quickly. <coughs> um, we had this just come out this summer at the National Convention. Um, and what I did is I just um, this is an amendment, right? Yes. Okay, and I, what I did is I literally took from the, the statements and I put it on here um, that the equipment should be removed prior to transfer to when appropriate. And they changed that. We got the statement and then a week later, which was about two weeks ago, maybe three, when appropriate. And we discussed that. And one of the things that and I'll show is what they're saying is when appropriate. And they're saying it's not appropriate, basically, if you don't have the, the um, manpower. You know, you don't want to go, okay, well, I'm going to take it off and it's only me. And that's, that's when I would deem it's not appropriate. And probably only then. Um, and, and there they have the statement, if fewer than three people are present, the equipment should be removed at the earliest possible time. Um, it, I don't think we need to click on that, but I, I shared that with Jason so that if you guys want to read there it is um, and where I got the information. Okay? Um, and again, the rationale for the equipment removal for us and why it's evolved, and I know it's been in discussion for years for athletic trainers and the discussion for why don't we take off the, particularly if, if there's a compromise, you know, compromised airway, of course the face mask. Well, what if they go into cardiac arrest? You know, then you have that chest plate. What are we going to do? And it's always been in that discussion, but they're they're always concerned about the C-spine injury, which we understand because you take that helmet off, or and just the helmet, and, and it flexes that neck. Um, so the expedited access to the athlete patient for enhanced provider care, chest access is prior, uh, prioritized for recommendation. So. The expedited access to the athlete patient for Nance, and, and, and the bottom line is they're saying that we know the equipment best, and why wouldn't we? We see it all the time, okay? That doesn't mean that we're, you know, we practice cutting these things off all the time. So that's why this is so important is we can troubleshoot, hey, well, that doesn't work really. Um, so um, that this is going to be, be really good to, in, you know, we've got ideas and uh, we're going to share it with you. Okay. Um, again, the recommendation nine also talks about employed to move a spine injured athlete patient from the field to minimize spinal motion. And then they, they have supported the eight person lift. Um, what I want to show you actually is go ahead to the next one. And that was again a recommendation by the NATA. Is this is this is some really cool stuff. We saw we went to the national or the, the Mid Atlantic, and this lady, this professor, uh, a PhD, um, had has a grant to study C spine injury and why the law role to quote her sucks. Um, and she, this is a really cool article. Let's go ahead and click on that. Um, 
She was, and we did, we did um, so a bunch of hands-on. It was very interesting. And I'm hoping that that'll slide. Come on up. And, and it shows the scoop, or the, the, the straddle scoop, or the straddle slide. Um, let's go ahead and slide down on that. It may not be that one, but I think it is. Oh, okay. There you go. And there's the figure. Let's go ahead with figure 14. Uh, Um, again, this is the lady who's done the study. 
Um, go ahead and click on that. I don't think that there's a whole lot on there that I just wanted to kind of, again, share that with Jason so that in the event you guys wanted to read up on it, um, I found it at 9.30 at night very interesting. I, I've read it a couple of times. Um, so <laughs> here is her article, um, and I did pull some quotes from it. Um, but again, it's talking about right there with the 15-year-old football play player, does anyone know what kind of cervical collar to put on the athlete or when? To clarify these and other issues, the NATA has released executive summary of human or association consensus, appropriate care. So this is where all of this has, has been born. So we're thrilled that you guys are willing to listen to us and to collaborate as we talk to CB, that's why we're here. Um, you guys know your end, we know our end, then we come to, you know, the best possible scenario for our content, you know, this, this athlete slash patient. So, um, any questions? Okay, and again, we'll just, we just wanted to show you some of the equipment. Um, I don't know if CB wants to, to share some of the information that we talked about. Yeah, and I just want to call her briefly with them as well. So, mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, so we have, do we have these? Do we have one of the white ones? The white ones will fold out. Not. On the truck, you did. Check. Well, since you took one bag, we can check one bag. Yeah, just so we can, we can probably need to look and get one. So, one of the things that we need to do as EMS providers is make sure that we are on our game. Um, when this the executive summary first came out, I was so excited because for 35 years, um, this has been a fight with EMS and athletic trainers everywhere. Um, and as I was telling them, <laughs> we used to do the UMass football games and we let the trainers do their thing, we put them in the ambulance and then we just take them all apart once we're there in the ambulance because we know what the hospital is going to do. And you guys have come into the hospital with boarded patients in the trauma bay. How long does it take before they start pulling off equipment? To answer out loud. Immediately, Immediate, like seconds. If they don't even, half the time we even hear the story, things are flying off. And this is one of those cases where this is probably the, not the best thing to do. Most of the patients we deal with from car accidents and that kind of thing, we have a very low suspicion for neck injury 99% of the time. This is a kind of an injury that has such high index of injury and the people are so young that it's important that we are diligent in everything that we do to take care of them. So when this summary came out, I was so excited because my biggest complaint is to measure the collar properly and put it on, the helmet is in the way and the pads are in the way, so we're actually not protecting the, the um, athlete at all. And then just by removing the face mask does not help us get at the airway because if you release the chin strap, you now lose the integrity of the head and the helmet in its position, and we need the chin strap to be removed to manage airways. So now we, you know, we get through all of it, we're trying to get everybody to understand. Truly, I think that EMS and athletic trainers is the place where this should happen on the field. There's nothing time sensitive on cervical spinal injury, believe it or not, if there is no airway compromise. We have time to talk as a team and say, hey, what do you guys think would be the best way to get this done? Because some of our ball players, you know, they look like uh, Refrigerator Perry. They're going to take a little bit more to take equipment off than you're going to have. Um, Let's see, who should I use as a skinny um, football player? But your quarterback. Be James River. Okay, <laughs> so there you go. So you get these tall, thin ones that they're a little bit easier to work with, but then you get the big refrigerator people, they're a little bit harder. We've got to be able to adjust our equipment, adjust our techniques, we've got to be able to work as a team, and that's what we're advocating that EMS does with um, the trainers. I've talked with Dr. Miller, who is the orthopedic surgeon who is it kind of in charge of like all these high schools and works with a number, number of other orthopedic um, physicians that are out there as well. And we've had long talks, swapped articles. They've been through the NATA summary, although it's changed since, it's, as she showed you, since the first uh, iteration came out. And he's on board. We're having a little trouble still with some of the orthopedic surgeons because in their mind they think that we'll board them and they'll go in the ER and they'll get x-rayed before they get removed. And I've had to assure them that that never happens. So Dr. Miller wants to make sure that I can assure him that EMS is going to be sharp. Because they are nervous. As you guys know, sometimes EMS makes you nervous. We've got a lot of people that do this from the goodness of their heart. 
and um, detail is not in there um, the way they do things. And sometimes, even though they're volunteers or not volunteers, they're trying to do the best they can, and sometimes it's not quite enough. So I'm going through with the services that I'm responsible for to say, this is what I'm expecting of you when you're working with them. There will be collaboration. You will talk about things. You will make sure everybody knows who's moving when, who's got what, before anything happens, and then we kind of work as a team. And then the last thing we want to do is we're going to get um, scoops. So as she demonstrated, log rolling is, has been known to be the worst possible movement for spinal movement in the history of what we do. It is the worst. Um, but we still do it repeatedly. And again, if these guys come in, how they're going to get taken off of the long board is log rolling in the hospital by a couple of nurses and the tech and somebody who may not be paying attention. Not that that's, I'm not saying they're not doing a good job, but that's just what they do in the ED. Everybody gets log rolled, everybody's got to have a back pet checked, blah, blah, blah. So that's part of the problem. Now, call it. You guys know there are measurements. We've been through this before as a group. I'm going to make sure you know all three callers. Lewis Gale, when you bring a patient down there, gives you the AMBU callers. They are measured somewhat similarly to these one size fits all in the stiff deck. So just let's review that. Today, everybody measures a collar on, on all different sizes. These collars do not fit everyone. So again, you get Refrigerator Perry out there. You may not be able to put a collar on this person. How many times have I had to say in a class, we don't want to take five pounds of shit and squeeze it in a two pound bag. Just by virtue of getting a collar on doesn't mean we've done our job if it doesn't really fit. So some players will not get a collar because we have nothing that works. We may have to improvise, okay? So don't put it on with a big gap over here just so you can say you got it on. It's just not the right thing. But we've got to make sure we know how to measure them, all right? Um, so, can I have, why have you, this is your nice and, you got all the landmarks I want. I'm going to have to sit this way. Facing that way. And again, all of these, the, if you forget how to measure, this bag actually has it printed on the bag so you can read it. This collar actually has it printed on the plastic so you can read it. They all come with instructions. It's the craziest thing. Instructions? <laughs> and for men, I know you don't like to read instructions, you just kind of figure it out. Okay, but here's the purpose of this. The collar is meant so that the chin piece fits under the chin, not against the trachea. And the, the, the back portion of the collar, the occiput portion has to come up at least a third of the way up the occiput. So just this alone, you can see that we're gonna have trouble with the helmet. The next part, so this keeps from flexion and extension. The next part of this is to prevent them from doing side bending. And in order to do that, the collar has to be measured properly so that the sides of the collar are halfway up the ears. And then it's got to be resting on the trapezius muscle. So again, if I got a gigantic gap here, I got a big gap here, I got the chin piece holding the nose up, we definitely have all the wrong parts in the wrong places. So the, by understanding how that collar is supposed to sit, it makes sense how we measure it. If they're sitting, it's easier to do because we don't have to get on the floor, but these guys are on the floor, so we will. You need to have your fingers pointed towards the nose, and you basically put the, the hand on the trapezius muscle, and with the head in neutral, neutral position, I'm eyeballing where the chin is. And the chin, right here, the, the bone on the chin, is sitting three fingers up from the trapezius muscle. So this is the gap that I'm trying to fill with the cervical collar. On this collar, the one that's not a stiff neck, the measuring line is down here. It says, <gasps> sizing line, right there. So I take the three fingers I've made to measure, and I basically put it on the sizing line, like this, this sizing line is the trapezius. I put my hand down on the trapezius, and I roll my three fingers down, and what do I see? The hole that is open is where the collar needs to be sized. I need to lock it in in the fourth hole, that's what the little thing's for. That's not to hold your oxygen tubing. That's to lock it into place so we have the proper size on the patient. Okay, so now the chin piece won't move, but this actually has the size that we need for the shoulders to the ears, and the chin piece and the breastplate are where it needs to be so we can have no flexion, and then this will sit because it's, it's uh, big enough. It should sit halfway up the back of her head. Now, when we put these on, the other thing that's really important is 
Getting the chin piece in first. Most people have a tendency to do this. They put the collar all the way back and then they try to fit this and squeeze. And as you can see, the head moves to one side because we've got to get it in there. How do we want you to put the collar on? You take the tab and you put it through. Usually what I do is I lay on the ground, I hold it like this and I push it down on the ground and I slide it underneath just so the tab comes up the other side so it's just dangling. Then I take the collar from the front and I come from underneath and I basically scoop the chin where I want it. And again, make sure all this little paper crap here. I scoop the chin into the cup the way I want it to sit. And then somebody from that side will pull on this tab and I will roll this tab in. And the collar then comes on nice and tight. Now, what do I have? This is sitting on the trapezius for the most part. I'm halfway up the ox foot. I am definitely in the chin piece and I'm not against the trachea in any way. And I'm halfway up at the up the ear, so that if this is on correctly, and once I have them tied to the stretcher, can you flex or extend? Really, there's there's so little movement when they're on correctly, but that's not what we often see, right? So I have a hundred pictures, as I've already told you guys, because you guys have been listening to me now for over a year. I have a hundred pictures of this, okay? It comes into the hospital, and this I got this big gap in here. We can put somebody's small child in there, or eventually, what she does is she'll she doesn't like so she's back, and then or they, if they make this tight, this plastic actually leaves a mark right here. As the patient's yelling, I can't breathe in this thing, and what are we saying? You can breathe. You're talking, and we forget that this plastic is pushing on the trachea and the and the larynx. It is uncomfortable. And then if they're belligerent or they're confused or concussed and they pull on this, they say, I, I want out of here. Next thing you know, they come in like this. And I got this gap here. I'm thinking, what are we doing? So you guys have got to get really diligent with this, making a measurement. Now, if she were on the floor, then your job is to get on the floor and your hand goes on the grass and the fingers go forward. And whether this is the trapezius or this is the trapezius, Whichever one you use on the trapezius goes on the measuring line. Now, stiff neck, they measure similarly but different. The stiff necks, and again, you've got to know your collars, the stiff necks don't have a measuring line. Their measuring line is the trapezius line. So, the, in her case, and, they, and, and it's funny, once you measure one and you get what your fingers match, they kind of all go. But you've got to do this a number of times to get used to it. So I take my three fingers for her, and I put it on the trapezius, and again, I look at it, and I say, oh, look at this. It's the top hole. It's the same as the other one. Again, I have to slide this up into the top hole. I have to lock it in. So stiff neck measures at the hard plastic. These um, Kroger type you know, the, the generic type, they have a sizing line right here, that's the trapezius line. And then the white ones that you get from the Lewis Gale, their sizing line, they have a black line that's written and it says sizing line right on it. So again, your hand goes with the trapezius and then you try to figure out which little, and they have like 87 blocks to go in. You can make a finer adjustment than you can with these. These either up or down. At least the other ones, you can adjust it a little bit better. The ones with the ambu that I don't like, the white ones, is that the chin folds out and it's actually more square than it is cut. So it's, they all get a different fit. Now it's been proven, and there are plenty of studies that say actually these collars and the ambu collars are by far the worst possible collars out there, especially when they're on wrong. They're as useful as no collar at all. So it's very important that these are done correctly. Um, and then they grade the different colors on the way up. Miami Jade is a little bit better. The aspirins are clearly a little bit better. And then a halo is like the top of the line, but we're not getting into halos. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> so since we, this is the, what's called the extrication collar, and if they have an injury when they get to the hospital, Neurosurge is going to take them out of this, or they're going to put an order in for us to take them out of this and put them in an, a, a, one of the pretend aspirins until the prosthetic people can get there and do a full aspirin. So they get changed a number of times, so we've just got to know how to work these things. Um, last thing is, and again, just to help you guys understand, you have a lot of your football people that will be transported. They don't all go to a level one that has more people than we know what to do with. So I work half time at Stonewall Jackson. So VMI and Washington and Lee, they'll come in fully equipped. Trust me, we're in big trouble because it's me and two nurses. That's what we have in the whole department. I don't know what you think we're supposed to do with that, but 
that's again, this is another good reason why if you guys do your thing, it just makes it so much easier on the little guy. And you, a lot of these patients are going to go to little hospitals first, get CT, and then find out there's an injury, and then they'll be sent to Rono to be handled by neurosurgery. So you've got to take into account what little these have. It's not all about Rono. And again, they are not trained in pulling helmets off. I know that people think they are, but they're not. So let, let's do that together. All right, so thank you for your body. <laughs> um, so you guys, I uh, promised TK that people that are responding to these football games are going to know how to work their collar. They're going to know how to work their scoop stretcher. We're going to the scoop, not the one you have. And one of my suggestions would be that each department just donate a scoop to the trainers. Have it on the sidelines so it's always there. So if you get an out-of-town ambulance that shows up and they don't have a scoop, we're, we're going to go backwards. Okay, so it might be easier instead of you guys, every unit carry one that maybe the school just gets one or maybe the school picks one up and then we train everybody how to use it properly. The scoop, the reason I've, I've chosen the scoop over the board is as you know when we rolled out our C-spine protocol is that we know the board causes a lot of damage. It's not, it's a, it's a set of handles, it's not an immobilizer. It does not immobilize the spine, believe it or not. It's a set of handles that moves the patient from point A to point B and once they're on the stretcher, really the board is supposed to come out from under it. It causes respiratory compromise, it causes sores, it causes all types of other things, but we try not to leave people on it any longer than we have to. So, with that being said, these guys are no different, they're healthy. That's how the board studies got done. They were healthy college students that they tied down on boards for a half an hour in a gym and they let them lay on the floor while we all sat around and drank coffee. And then a half an hour later, we took them all off the board and there wasn't one person in the room that didn't have a pressure, stage one pressure ulcer starting somewhere. And they had pain and aches that they didn't have when they, before they laid down on the floor. Which again, makes it very difficult for me to assess a patient once they've been tied to a board and now everything hurts because I can't focus on what I need to focus on. So boards are out, they're definitely out, they're out, they're definitely out, all right, out. If you get stuck using a board, it might be worth Put the patient on the boards with the lift that they're going to talk about. Get them on it. Get them on the stretcher and then lift the patient as a unit and take the board out of the end and put them on the mattress flat. You know, and then again, you know, take their head to the stretcher. That's better for the patient all the way around than driving them to the hospital, especially you guys. Some of you guys pack a lunch to get to the hospital from here. And it's a long <laughs> ride. Like when you say, you know, well, it's not that far along. So these guys here, sometimes they're with the patient for a very long time, mm -hmm. all the way to the hospital, around right the parents' house, the street bench. And this kind of thing, and it's really there. This is a, one of the places that's really too long. So, if you get forced to put somebody on a board, consider once they're on the stretcher as a team, just picking the patient up, slide the board out, put them down, and then take the head of the stretcher. That would be perfect. Now, remember the anatomy of the spine. You know, we've got the head, we've got the spine, which this, this mechanism right here looks like a maraschino cherry, right? We've got a big cherry, and then this little stem holding everything on there. And then we've got the T and L spine, and the T is attached to the the trunk, so there's a little bit more support there, and then the L spine is very much like the C, there's very little support. However, where we bend is actually at the hips. Our stretchers are made so that once they're on the stretcher, if, they're, if their fanny is on the stretcher, where the bending mark is, you should be able to put them at 20 to 30 degrees up because they bend here. The spine stays straight, completely straight with the head tied down, and you plop the stretcher up one or two notches, they bend at the hips, this is the motion that they have at the hips. That's the motion you want to have when you're taking them off the, off the ground to take their equipment out. It's big, you're bending them here, no place else. Bend. And you only need, it's a matter of inches, guys. I can't say what I want to say because we have mixed company. Ladies, there are men in the room, but <laughs> I, there's a reason why it's only in a game of inches. And if I point me this out, then you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so, I foresee that it would be, make a lot of sense if, while they're, you're responding, although some places have the EMS person right on scene at the, at the time, so well, we'll see what happens. But let's go ahead, everybody's got to get up, measure collars, put them on, so I'm sure that you guys know what you're doing, and then they're going to do their uh, check with, teach us how to take this equipment off, and then we're going to try to work on getting patients out. Can we put somebody in it and like, work together? Take it off? Okay. Some of you guys have been into this, right? All right, so let's measure collars. Everybody pair up. I want everybody's hands in the 